Thank you for joining me. I'm glad you're here. I want to look at Romans chapter 3. Last week we made a reference to justification, and I wanted to unpack some of that there. It's a big term. You probably know what it means, but there's a lot involved in it. And I think as we look at it, we'll find reasons for worship. And so Romans chapter 3, and... As we look here in Paul's letter to the Romans, you know, in Romans chapter 1, he, he sets out his introduction, greets the people there, and then he starts his teaching. And by the end of chapter 1, he's been very convincing of the downward spiral of humanity from God. And then in chapter 2, he looks at the special case of the, of the Hebrew people as they had the revealed word of God, and yet they failed to meet up to it. And so in chapter 3, he combines the two and shows that we need a Savior. We are in desperate need of being saved from our sins. And that's where we pick up here as he's just strung together a series of Old Testament quotes from the Hebrew Scriptures that there is none righteous, no, not one. That there is none who seeks after God. There is none who does what is right. They are wicked in every part. And in verse 19 of Romans chapter 3, he says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law, as revealed in these scripture quotes, most of them are from the Psalms, some from Deuteronomy, some from the prophets. They, they tell the truth. And we provide empirical evidence every day. In fact, 2020 was a, a petri dish of sin and selfishness, especially in our country. Now, there were some very good people who continue to do. But if we're all honest, we know what's real about us. And that is that we still continue to sin and rebel. And to give an example of that. We chafe against being told what to do. We don't like it. We don't like being told to wear masks. We don't like being told how fast to drive. We don't like uh, all these things. Things that we would normally do, we don't want to do if someone told us to do those. We're all little five-year-olds in that way. And so, the Apostle Paul here, he says that this is what the law has been saying every mouth stopped no one has a defense even our efforts to keep the law reveal that condemnation it's just reinforcing what the testimony of God's prophets are the law is a perfect measuring stick and it shows that we fall short of that measurement and that we are crooked by nature. So we're guilty and without a defense. The law cannot exonerate us because it is the one that reveals that sin nature. So what is to be done? Can anyone be made right in God's eyes? Or are we all doomed to spend eternity not only what we deserve, but what we inwardly want to be away from God and doing our own thing? Because the reality is, that's what hell is. To be away from the felt presence of God and in our own self alone. Is there hope? Verse 21. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. 
even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all of sin falls short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now there's a lot of big words in there. One of them is the righteousness of God. So let's look at that. This is the right standing that not only belongs to God, but that also is from God to be given to us because we can't make it on our own. We don't have that kind of righteousness. But it is available, and it's apart from keeping the law. Because as we pointed out, if we broke one part of the law, then we're guilty of breaking all of the law. We just cascade upon that. We're an avalanche when we start breaking the law. Because by nature, that's where we are. We are inherited that from Adam, from our fathers. But the law and the prophets bears witness, Paul says, that there is a righteousness of God that can be had through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. Now this is one of our key key sections here. This righteousness of God is granted to those who confess and believe that they don't have any on their own. So God worked a plan. It was conceived by the Father. It was enacted by the Son. And it is applied by the Spirit to individuals. Which individuals? It's unto all. But not just to them. It is on all who believe in Jesus the Messiah. Because Jesus is the one who had accomplished the righteousness of God. Being God himself, yet he set aside all the majesty and the, and the glory in order to live as one of us to accomplish perfect righteousness of God. To accomplish that perfect righteousness of God. A full lifetime of righteousness. He accomplished because all of us had fallen short of God's glory do you see that you remember that from the Romans road all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God none of us had anything going for us but Christ never sinned and so he had perfect righteousness that could be imputed to others, to be granted to others. And so we see there in verse 24 that we can be justified freely by his grace. And that justified is a legal term that takes a look at the law and at an individual and says this individual is not a lawbreaker. The righteous demands of the law have been met. Now, it's not true of us in our own nature. We would be condemned. That's the opposite of justification. Hence the reason later on in Paul's letter to the Romans, he can say there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus because they've been justified. You see, the, that's the, the pairing that goes on there. One is condemnation. On the other side is justification. There's no condemnation. And so he says that he can justify us freely because the righteous requirement of the law was fulfilled in Christ. And it's freely. Nothing we can do to earn it. Nothing we can do to, to make it ours except simply to admit that we don't have it on our own and to ask for it. 
because it's by his grace. When God revealed himself in the Hebrew scriptures, he revealed himself as one who was compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in covenant love, full of mercy, yet one who would not exonerate the guilty. He would punish sin. So how is that tension to be broken? It's in Christ Jesus. Because of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He paid the price for that sin. That all those guilty sins. Because that's one way to be justified. Is to say that the righteous requirement of the law has been met. Either by perfect obedience or by a perfect punishment for that sin. And Christ accomplished both. In his life, he had perfect obedience to the law. In his death, he provided a perfect punishment for a law for those who were in Christ. And so the perfect punishment for their sin landed upon Christ. And that is the redemption. Like captives to sin, we've been purchased from that. The penalty has been paid for. Whom God set forth as a propitiation. So the appeasement of his wrath. That's what that word propitiation is talking about. Is that the righteous demands for justice have been served. We want justice when someone else does us wrong. But we usually don't want justice when we have done wrong. We want mercy. But in God's way of doing things, there always has to be justice. But for him to show mercy to his beloved creatures, because God is love, he still has to punish that sin. But there is a vicarious punishment made by Jesus. He is the propitiation by his blood. And we receive it by faith, through faith. Now that would be unfair of God in some ways, to have someone else punish for yours and my sins. It would be fair if we suffered the punishment for our sins, but that wouldn't be mercy. But God allowed himself to bear the brunt of that justice. And that's what makes it appropriate that God can still demand that justice is that he paid it himself. God the Son, by his blood. We've been purchased by the blood of Christ, of God himself. And so God's justice has been satisfied and it removed us from wrath. And again, we have to trust in Christ that he has done this for us. It's not just enough to say, I think Christ existed. Or that even that uh, he was a good man and died on a cross. You can even say he believed, you believe he rose from the dead. But unless you believe he did that for you, it's not applied to you as a sinner. And so we see here where that is the redemption and the propitiation, the appeasement of the justice of God. And these demonstrate God's righteousness. Because righteousness is the key thing in this. How is God righteous in forgiving sinners? It's because he has punished that sin. The judge of all the earth will do what is right. And so the legal verdict is that that sin has been punished. And so it would be inappropriate by, for God to punish us for sins that Christ has paid for and that we have claimed Christ for our Savior. And so that's how we know that we are uh, justified. And one day we will see it and hear it with our own ears when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 
But it is already accomplished. It is finished and final. And so there is no condemnation. One is not guilty before the law anymore because those sins were paid for. But also it shows God's righteousness in that he had passed over. He had, in some ways, been slack in not bringing all the hammer down on the sins of the past before Christ. Because those people were saved by looking forward to what God was going to do to pay for their sins. It was through the sacrifices they were making there in the old covenant. But those things weren't able to remove sin. But they were a symbol pointing to what Christ was going to accomplish. And so it demonstrated his righteousness because in his forbearance, in his patience, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed in order to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness. That God is not slack. He will not, that he will not allow the guilty to go free without there being justice because he took it upon himself. And nothing says how much God hates sin that he would take the cross to pay for those sins. And so we shouldn't be cozy with sin either, knowing that what the penalty for sin is and God's righteousness and his love to bear that penalty for us. That God might be just, that he may be righteous and do justice and yet still be able to justify sinners to say that they are free because they're in Christ Jesus. And there's a phrase here at the end of his argument in chapter 4, because Paul doesn't finish with the subject in chapter 3. It goes on into 4 and in 5, and really throughout much of the letter. But in chapter 4, at the end of it, he says, this he raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered because of our offenses we just talked about that and was raised because of our justification because our justification was accomplished Christ rose from the dead one of the evidences of that justification that we've been declared righteous is that Christ rose from the dead the price was paid in full he doesn't need to be dead any longer and so we celebrate the resurrection we just finished celebrating Christmas uh, the week before this was recorded. And that's celebrating Christ coming to earth to live that righteous life. But he came to die, foretold from the beginning. And living, he died, but he rose again to show that it had been all accomplished. The job was done. And he goes on then to be our high priest and to be our king to reign over all and so this is a chance for us as guilty individuals who are now innocent individuals justified to worship to live like what God has declared us to be to thank God for having done that work to affect our head that way. To really ponder on these things. Because it's a hard one for me to wrap my brain around. But it's important for us to come daily to wash at the cross. To remember that our sins are washed clean. And we've been, it's been freely given. I don't have to try to earn God's acceptance. It's already been accomplished in Christ. And that and the heart stir me to love to remind me how much my Savior loves me and then to go forth and to live like that to tell others 
This is the kernel of the gospel. That sinners by nature can be reconciled to a God who is holy by nature, by the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so let us pray. Father, so thankful that you conceived of the plan, that your son Jesus enacted the plan. And I thank you that your Holy Spirit opened my eyes to apply this plan to me. And I thank you, God, for the faith. I thank you, God, for your grace. Because it's not of me. And so, Lord, help me to be more enraptured by your love, by your great grace that you demonstrated at the cross. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Forgive me and my fellowship with you, God, of the sins that hamper that. I want to be more in love with you each day. I don't want to be cold-hearted. And in the name of Jesus Christ, my Savior, I pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining me. And I hope you've thought on these things and continue to think on these things uh, until we meet again. God bless.